come on, give, give, give. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much, Pastor Tim, Pastor uh, Jenny, and of course, Pastor Kim, uh, for the venue that we have tonight. Okay, uh, I'm really honored and privileged, my, me and my wife, to be with you tonight. And you know, we are here because we believe in revival. Amen. Come on, do you believe in revival? Uh, of course, we believe in personal revival, and that happens a lot. Maybe to some of you, you have been revived for 100 times already. <laughs> okay, so of course, uh, personal revival happens, and of course, we also believe in church revival. Amen. Amen. And we believe in national revival. Now, and, and when I say when when I talk about believing in national revival or, or church revival, actually, this is not just a belief. This is an experience in the case of us, and we have been seeing revivals happening not just in the Philippines, but in so many nations. Now, uh, in the United States, and in South America, of course, in Asian countries, even in Russia, okay, in many co in various continents, we are seeing a lot of revivals. Now, and uh, that's why we have this kind of gathering because we must believe that no matter the status of the churches, no matter the age of the churches, we must believe that there can be revival. Amen. Amen. Hello. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, one of the, of course, one of the models of a revival that I really admire, in which I, I pray for, is what's happening in Korea. No? Particularly in the earlier uh, days, uh, we have seen a lot of revival. So many uh, people turning to the Lord. A huge percentage of Korean people uh, have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and are serious in their faith. And uh, we are so happy about that. And of course, we we in the Philippines have prayed that Lord, please make uh, uh, make the churches in the Philippines like those in Korea. No? So that's also our prayer. And you know, you know what? Um, of course, this is our concern now because what's happening is that in Korea, uh, there are churches that are losing their young people. No? They are losing the younger generation to K-pop. No? And, but you know what? You know what? No, I'm sharing this with you because there's this one church that we have held in the island of Jeju, and uh, um, of course uh, they are now connected with Pastor Lawrence Kong. No, and this church, you know, they are winning a lot of young people. And I don't know if uh, was it during uh, the conference this year, or uh, I think even this year. No, uh, Pastor Tim was with us in Bogota, Colombia. No, uh, with Pastor Jenny, and I, I don't know if you observed that there were so many Koreans there. No, last year there were so many young Koreans, no? young people, and they were attending the conference. No, why? Because we believe that uh, the revival in Korea is continuing. Amen. Hello, amen, po, and it can continue. Amen. Okay. Uh, let me just share with you what's happening to the Philippines. Um, we are seeing churches that are really um, now on fire. Now, when we talk about revival, of course, we are not just talking about numbers. No, no. Of course, numbers is part of the revival, part, part of the product of revival that is happening. But we are seeing change lives, people being transformed, people, young people on fire for the Lord. They are in love for the Lord. You can see them in, 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 in their spiritual disciplines. You can see them in the way they handle their relationships. Why? Because revival is truly happening. Okay? Uh, we, uh, there, there are pastors, there, there are stories of pastors who were about to resign, but when they received this revival, this work of the Lord in their lives and in their church, now they're inspired pastors again. No, uh, and of course there are churches, it's also very common in the Philippines to see churches with only 50 people, 30 people. Now it's becoming common to see churches with hundreds of people Amen. and even thousands of people. Amen. Why? Again, this is not just about numbers, but we also believe that when the church is on fire, number comes as a byproduct. Amen. 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 When, that when the church, uh, when there's quality, there's quantity. Actually, we, we cannot separate the two. When there's true quality in our churches, you will also find quality. Do you agree with me in that? Huh? That's why we are here, because we're going to talk about um, about what the Lord wants to do in our respective churches. Hello? Yeah. Okay. So do you, uh, do you believe in that God gives us vision for our respective churches? Yeah. Okay. So uh, actually we call this vision casting. 
Okay. Because uh, we are encouraging our churches, pastors, leaders, and members to have vision for their respective churches. You know, I came to know the Lord when I was in high school, and because of that, I received my calling at an early age. So I proceeded to the Bible college, and I became a pastor. Yeah, of course, uh, when I became a pastor, I just wanted to serve the Lord. But I, I, I would like to admit to you that I was pastoring without a clear vision. And that happens to a lot of pastors, to a lot of ch churches, to a lot of, of church leaders, members. We just come to church Sunday by Sunday without vision. Hello, do you agree with me? Yes. And there are also pastors in even churches who started with a grand vision, but eventually uh, when, uh, when the things are not happening according to, to, to what they have dreamed of, then they lost their vision. But tonight, we're going to talk about vision. Hello? Yeah. Okay? So, now when we talk about vision, the vision should be big. Come on, say it aloud. Big. big. You spell big? big. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> okay, big. Now, uh, I just want to, uh, to, to just share this with you briefly, then I'm going to proceed with, with my um, main message tonight. Now, when we say big vision, uh, B stands for beneficial to others. Beneficial to others. When your dream for your church, for your ministry is just for your own church, okay, or, or just uh, for the benefit of the people who are already there, no, then that's a small vision. We should have big vision. Should be beneficial to other people, to other churches. We should be reaching out to more people. Okay? And I, a big vision is impossible to you impossible to you well if it's something uh, that is very possible to you then maybe that is not from the lord hello because when the lord gives a vision it should be something that you cannot do without his help but when but when it's, it comes from the lord it is something that you really have to depend on god okay so impossible to you and g is glorifying to god okay glorifying to God, you know, when our vision is small and then we are able to uh, attain it, then we are, uh, then that, full, that vision is fulfilled. You know what? Actually, um, the, the glory can, can, can be given to us, right? Yeah. Hello, we, hello. You know, it, it can be credited to the church, it can be credited to the leaders, to the pastor, yeah. you know? but when the vision is so big that it is truly impossible to you, and when it comes, when it happens, you know what? All the glory belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we should have big vision. Come on, say it aloud, pastors, please. Now, big vision. Okay. Can we just come to the Lord in prayer now? And let's pray, let's pray, let's just commit this time. Lord, we depend on you. We look up to you, Lord. Your servant who is standing in front of the servants of yours and is nothing, Lord, without you speaking through him. So we pray for the fullness of your Holy Spirit. We pray for your anointing. We pray, Lord, that you make us good soil for your word. Amen. So that we will not just be hearing your word. We will not just be hearing truths from you. But this will truly be planted in our hearts. Yes. And it will bear fruit, Lord, not just in our personal lives, not just in our individual lives, but in our respective churches. And we pray, Lord, that this will bear fruit to this nation, yes. Lord. And even to the nations that are represented here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessing. We depend yes. on your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, and amen, okay? Now, um, <coughs> I want us to talk about sales. Come on, can, can you say that aloud? Sales. Yes. You know, according to experts, our bodies are composed of five kinds of cells. We have skin, skin cells, muscle cells, bone cells, nerve cells, and blood cells. Okay, and according to experts also, when we were born, the very tiny baby that we were, we were composed of about 30, uh, 32, bil no, 32, billion, yeah, 32 billion cells. Look at the one seated beside you. He's really a billionaire, no? no? Billionaire with cells. Okay, but you know what? Uh, I, 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 of course, as we grow and uh, as we attain our full growth potential from 32 billion cells. You know, according to experts, we now have in our bodies 51 trillion cells. Wow, wow 51, hello, trillionaires. Okay, wow, no? Well, of course, we also know 
that the distribution of those cells depend from person to person, right? Yeah. Hello, yeah. right? No? Some people have more cells in their nose, so they have pointed noses. <laughs> Some have few cells, that's why they have disappointed nose. No? So, well, it depends, right? Some cells are stuck here. <laughs> Actually, that's not cells. That's cellulite. <laughs> okay? But, oh, yeah, the truth is, um, it, it depends, right? Of, of course, the distribution of those cells uh, uh, is different from the, from the person to another. But I'm just saying this to you because from a very tiny baby, we have attained our full growth potential. What happened? Because of multiplication. Hello? Yeah. Multiplication, right? Okay, and do you believe that the body of Christ should also grow? Hello, hello, no? Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 16, it's clearly said there that, of course, in verse 11, verse 12, we are very much familiar with those few, with the first two verses, that the Lord gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right? Right, to equip God's people to do the work of the ministry. And in verse 16, it says that, uh, as each part does its work, the body grows. Hello. Okay. As each part does its work, the body grows. So how can the church grow numerically, spiritually, when each part does its work? When it's not only the pastor or the pastor's wife or the leaders of the church who are doing their work. Remember, pastors, that our, first, that, that our job description, the main uh, part of our job description is that we should be equippers. Hello, we should not just be preachers. We are called to be the keepers. God gave some to be pastors. Why? So that these pastors, so that these church leaders, we equip the people, we train the people to do the work of the ministry. No? And when we do the work of the ministry, when the people of God do the work of the ministry, of course the church is strengthened. Amen? Spiritually. It becomes equality church, and when it becomes equality church, of course, quantity follows. Hello? Okay, so uh, we, we have to really be convinced that the church people are not called just to be seated in the church, just to, uh, just to worship, no, but we are all called to do our part. And when each part does its work, we are seeing growth. Okay, that's the secret there. Okay, so what should happen is that every member of the church is just like a single cell that multiplies and multiplies. Because when a, when a child of God is bringing people to the Lord, when a child of God is allowing himself to be used by the Lord, then, of, of course, it's a, it's a normal byproduct that we are seeing uh, people being added to the Lord. Hello, Amy Po? Of Po is a sign of respect in the Philippines. Are there Filipinos here? Are there Filipinos? Okay, uh, there are Kabayans here. That's a little familiar. No? Okay, uh, so, yeah. So, so uh, let's, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about multiplication. So the, the question that should be asked by, uh, by pastors uh, when it comes to their members is that what kind of people do I have in my church? Okay. Do I have multiplying people? Okay. Or if I am a member of the church, I should also evaluate myself and ask, what kind of a, uh, of a believer am I? What kind of a member am I? Am I a multiplying child of God? Because do you believe that we are all called to multiply? Amen. Hello? Amen. Do you agree with me that we are all Amen. called to multiply? Yeah. Come on, when you get married, you want to multiply. Yeah. When you are working, you want your money to multiply. But when you come to the Lord, you do not want to multiply. <laughs> That's unfair. Okay? Hello, and you say that the Lord, the Lord is the first, first love of my life. Being a believer is the best thing that has happened to my life. But you do not have a vision for the best thing that has happened to your life. Hello? Okay? So, we should have that kind of uh, desire to multiply. Now, uh, if no, we are not being multi multipliers, what are we? Okay? I, I just want us to uh, do this. I just want to show something for us to be able to evaluate ourselves and to, for the pastors to evaluate our people as well. Is it okay? Okay, so let's just have a review, a, a little review of math. Do you love math? I don't, I don't. That's why I became a pastor. But I, at least I knew, I knew some, some math. 
Okay, like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I just think about this. Four plus two. Wow, good. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> oh, others did calculator, huh? No? Okay, four plus two is six. Okay, this is what I learned in math. No, They have a term for each of the numbers there. Like the number four is called ogen. Right? The, from here, the word augment come or came from. Okay? Uh, ogen is, yeah, augment, meaning this is the number that uh, that must be increased. Okay? So, four is the ogen, and number two is aden. Hello? Aden. No? I'm sorry I prepared my PowerPoint, but maybe because of the long trip from Manila to Sydney. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there. No? So, yeah. Again, again is the number that is to be added. Right? And six is? Six is? You call it? Sum. Hello? Okay? Okay, so that's in addition. Now, in, in subtraction, subtraction, 4 minus 2 is? Of course, 2. And what do you call 4? Minuend. Minus. From here, the, from here, the word minus come. Right? Right? So, minuend. Okay? The number that is to be deducted from. Okay? And number 2 is? Yeah, subtrahen, no? And two is difference. Are you making a difference? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so many members are <laughs> are being minus from the church. That's why they're making a difference. Okay. Div uh, okay, let's talk about division. Division. Four my less. Or four divided by two. Four divided by two. Of course, two. No, uh, four is called dividend. No, and two is divisor, and two is quotient. Right? Quotient. Okay. Now here, here, multiplication. Okay. Let's consider multiplication. Four times two. Come on, I know you know that. No? <laughs> four times two. Okay. Uh, of course, eight. Four is called multiplicand. Okay? And two is called multiplier. No? Of course, we've learned this in the element, maybe elementary, right? Okay, so, so uh, it betrays your age. <laughs> okay, so, okay, uh, multiplicand, multiplier, and what's number eight? Prada. Come on, can you talk? Okay, come on, can you tell the person beside you? Have you noticed? Come on, have you noticed? Only the multipliers have product. Amen. Hello. Only the multipliers have product. Why are there so many people in the churches that are not being productive because they are not serving as multipliers? But we are called to be multipliers. Right? Okay? Now, if we are not being multipliers, what are we? Of course, the first choice is to be an added. Okay? And there are many mem members in our churches who are content with just being added. Okay? Please don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Of course, as pastors, we value everyone who is in the church. And as individuals, we are all valued by the Lord. Amen? Amen? Uh, but by ourselves, we are so important to God. But please, don't be content with just us being one of those people that are being valued by God. Why don't we also bring people to the Lord so that these people will also find their value in God? Hello? Right? Because to be added is not is actually not uh, adding some people to church. You are just being added. So it's, there's a big difference from adding, you adding others to just being, to you just being added. Right? Right? And some people are just content with that and they are even proud of that and they would even say, oh, pastors, actually, you, you have to be grateful because I'm not, because I am here. Right? No? Because if I'm not here, this, this chair would be empty. <laughs> well, okay, we, uh, we, again, we appreciate your presence. 
but we are not just called to be adults. Others are subtrahims. Have you seen members in the churches that are subtrahims? Hello? Hello? Have you lost some people in your churches? Okay? Hello? And, and the fun thing is that there are churches, there, there are people who are this Sunday, they are adults, next Sunday they are subtrahims. Okay? Right? And the following Sunday they are adults again. Okay? Or there are those who, who when, are, when they are offended or when they do not like the preaching of the pastor, they immediately become subtrahims. Right? And the, another sad thing is that a Christian is uh, moving from one church to another. So he becomes subtra he serves as a subtrahim there to be added there. Right? Hello? But do you think that God called, Christ called Christians to be subtrahims? No? We are called to be committed to the spiritual family where God called us. Amen? Okay? So we are, we are not supposed to be subtrahims. Others are divisors. Have you seen members that are divisors? Hello? Okay? Uh, and they are even proud of calling themselves pastor in this church. I am the devil's advocate. <laughs> Hello? No, are, are we really called to be, to be devil's advocate? Come on. No? But, there, but do you believe that God hates division? Hello? You know what? Um, the, actually, the hardest words that are spoken when it comes to church discipline in the New Testament is about uh, division. Like, uh, of, of course, we have read the, the word, uh, you are the temple of uh, the Holy Spirit, right? In 1 Corinthians 3. But in 1 Corinthians 9, you are the temple of God. Okay? So, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, it's about us, our bodies being God's temple. Because the Holy Spirit of God resides in uh, oh no, that's in 1 Corinthians 6, sorry. 1 Corinthians 6, because it's about purity, right? It's about righteousness, okay? So it's about our body. But in 1 Corinthians 3, you know what? You know what? The context there is uh, about uh, division. Because other people are saying, I am for Paul. I am Apollos. I, and others are, I am Jesus. Hello? So the context was about division. That's why in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, don't you know that you are God's temple? And anyone who destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Okay? So God is so serious about the unity of his church. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And Titus 3 verse 10, Titus, Paul said, warn a divisive person once. And then warn him twice. After that, have nothing to do with him. Hello, that's excommunication right there. Right? So God wants his family to be united. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, God wants the church to be united. Okay, so God doesn't want uh, doesn't want division. When, when you are uh, uh, when God places you in a spiritual family, the best uh, way to maintain unity of, of course is to have a leader. Because if everyone is a leader then it's really difficult to have followers. So it's really difficult to have unity. Amen? Okay? So of course, God doesn't want us to be adults, neither to be subtrahims, of course, not to be divisors. God calls us to be multipliers. Now, pastors, do you want your people to be multipliers? Yes. Come on, come on. No? Uh, people of God, do you want to be multipliers? Yes. God, that should be our desire. And I want us to be this to be in our heart. And when we leave this place, I, I, I really want us to receive the anointing for multiplication. Okay, because God is truly giving anointing for multiplication. It, it, as I said earlier, it, happens, it, it is happening in so many countries now. Okay? So we must believe that God is able to multiply our people. Again, when I say multiplication, please do not think that I am just talking about numbers. We are talking here of disciples. That's why our vision statement in our church is this, a spirit-filled church with multitudes of genuine disciples. Okay? A spirit-filled church with multitudes of genuine disciples greatly glorifying God in the city. Okay? So, of course, quality and quantity should always go together. Okay? So let's talk about multiplying. 
Do you want multiplication? Come on, do you want multiplication? Let's take a look at this passage, Acts 11, 19, verse 26. Acts 11, verse 19 to 26. You know, it's interesting how in the book of Acts, um, the writer, of course, Dr. Luke, emphasized how the church grew. Also in numbers okay remember it was emphasized when peter preached three thousand people were added to the lord right afterwards uh five thousand right then afterwards actually that's the last number no three thousand five thousand after that because there were so many they used they just used the word multitude or great numbers or great crowd so they came to the point that they uh that they were tired of uh, counting already, so they just said multitude. Why? It's too many. Just call it multitude. So what do you prefer? Uh, being tired of counting because there's too many or being tired of counting because there's too few? <laughs> when you look at, uh, uh, that's 25. <laughs> so you don't have to count. Okay. But when you say a multitude, wow. No? So I, uh, for, for me, it's better to get tired of counting because there's too Many, just like the offering, right? Uh, when you look at it, uh, you, you, you get you easily get there. But uh, that's too few. <laughs> okay, uh, but of course, uh, here uh, we can see uh, again the emphasis on uh, on the uh, numerical growth of the church. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, uh, yeah, of course, Stephen was martyred, right? And the persecution started, so the believers who were uh, usually congregating uh, in Jerusalem, now they were dispersed, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Can you say that aloud, Antioch? Antioch. We're going to talk about Antioch. You know why? Antioch is a very important city in the history of Christianity. Okay? Of course, it is in Jerusalem that Christianity was born. But you know what? After Jerusalem, the, cent the second center, or even the uh, next center of Christianity was Antioch. Okay, when, when it, it was uh, already hard for uh, the Jerusalem believers, for, for, the, for the people there to truly be uh, visible in, in, in their faith, then you know, it, it was in Antioch that uh, somehow God transformed the, uh, the base okay, of Christianity. It is also the sending base of uh, Paul in his mission works, right? Okay, so speaking the word to no one except Jews. They were preaching to no one except their fellow Israelites. Verse 20. Verse, verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And you know what happened. No? So they, they preached about the Lord Jesus. Okay, verse 21. <coughs> And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Come on, can you say that aloud? Great number. Great and I want us to note how many times these two words were mentioned. Okay, the word great number, no? So many, great number who believed turned to the Lord. Verse 22, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Verse 23, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Okay, verse 24, okay, can you read it aloud with me please? For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Again, great many people, or in other translation, great numbers. The second time. Okay, number of oh, verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Okay, and for a whole year, they met with the church and taught. Come on. Third, no, great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Okay, from these three verses where uh, the words great many or great numbers were mentioned, there are three factors of multiplication that I want us to talk about. That's why I call these X factors. Okay, do you want your church to have X factors? Okay, meaning we have multiplication factors. 
Uh, so there, there are three. Number one, it's in verse. Was it in verse 22 when, uh, of course, they preached to the people, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Number one is campaign. What do I mean by campaign? Of course, there are many kinds of campaigning, right? Right? No? Uh, there, of course, a military campaign, right? It's also campaign. But of course, more popularly, we use the word campaign during elections. Hello? Right? So what's the, what's the purpose of campaign? Uh, for me, if, I, if I'm going to define the word campaign, I would just say it is making somebody known and chosen by the people. When you campaign for someone because you want him to be known and you want him to be chosen. Right? So, so uh, making someone known and chosen by the people. Now, it's very important that you agree with me that we should be campaigning for Jesus. So that the people will come to truly know him and choose him to be the Lord and Savior of their lives. Okay? Um, there's this one story about a senator. Is there a senator here? Okay, 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 someday, no? There's this one story about a senator who, who just uh, after campaigning uh, was uh, going home when, it, when suddenly, bang! He met an accident. And he's, he was dead on the spot. And he just awoke in the afterlife. And in the afterlife, he saw an angel. Uh, and behind the angel were two doors. So uh, the angel greeted him and said to him, uh, Good evening, Senator. Welcome to the afterlife. And the senator reacted, Yeah, right. Uh, I, I, I'm not really expecting this. Uh, but anyway, I see two doors behind you. Uh, can you tell me uh, which one I'm going to, uh, to enter? And the angel said, You know, Senator, here in the afterlife, it's just like earthly life. You have the freedom of choice. We have democratic here. We, 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 have, we have democracy here. No? So, uh, but for you to make a choice, we are going to tour you. No? We, we are going to allow you for, for a day. You're just going to spend time uh, in these two doors. So which one do you want to experience first? Okay, I'm, I'm going to the left. Okay, so uh, the senator uh, went uh, and, and stood in front of the door at the left and it opened and then he entered and then the door closed and then it went down 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 it was an elevator no and then it, went, it, it opened again and lo and behold he saw a very beautiful hell <laughs> wow beautiful hell is so nice oh huh? wow, it's so clean and the people seem to be very happy and he, even uh, when when satan saw him was so accommodating to him and even he accompanied him and as he spent time with the whole day in hell he realized he has so he had so many friends there <laughs> so so in short he enjoyed his stay in hell then uh, after those 24 hours uh, after his time the angel called him again uh, senator it's time for you to visit the other door so he went up uh, entered the door the right uh, and then it closed and it brought him up, it opened again, and he saw he also a very beautiful heaven. No? He saw that, yeah, heaven is also beautiful. And as, as he was spending his time there, uh, he was thinking, uh, there's, the heaven and hell really look alike. No? Uh, there's not much difference, but I have, so, I have more friends in, in hell. <laughs> so even while he was there, you, you, you can discern the kind of choice that he's going to make. To, to make no? So uh, after his time, uh, the angel called him. No? So, okay, uh, Senator, what's your choice? I'm going to the left. Hell? No? The angel said, yeah, right. No? Uh, are you sure that's going to be for eternity? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, now you go there. So, so the door opened, he entered, it went down, it opened again, and he saw a very ugly hell. Okay, uh, uh, there were so many garbages on the street, no? Flood, uh, floods all around. The people are like beggars. No? They are so, uh, there are a lot of sufferings happening. No? And uh, Satan approached him and said, Hey, Senator, it's nice that you have chosen hell. You will be here forever. Welcome to hell. And the Senator go, went, Yeah, right. I'm just wondering because I was just here yesterday. And 
why is it that it seems so different now? No? And Satan said, uh, hugged him and said, oh, you know, Senator, no? I, I, I think you're used to this. You know what? Yesterday was campaign. <laughs> Today is the real thing. <laughs> oh, there's no senator here, right? Okay. But I'm saying this to you because do you believe that Satan is campaigning for hell? Yes. Come on, come on. Do you believe that Satan is campaigning for hell? Yes. And he will do everything to just keep people going to hell. Hello? Yes. Right? Do you know that Satan would even be kind, so kind, so that a person can go to hell? And I can understand why can Christians not be kind so that others can go to heaven? You know, do, you, do you agree with me that Satan can be kind? Yeah, he can be good, but he can be kind. Right? Right? Hello? Right? So Satan would do everything just to bring people to it. He's campaigning for hell. So if Satan is campaigning for hell, why can't we campaign for Jesus? All the more that we should be campaigning for the Lord, Jesus, so that the people would choose him to be the Lord and Savior of their lives. Yes. You know what? No matter, no, no matter the changes, despite of all that's happening in our society, despite of all the uh, advances in sciences or whatever, uh, despite of all the mo ma modernism, postmodernism, or whatever, the fact remains that people are still sinners, that Jesus is still the only Savior, and that these people without knowing Jesus in their lives are still going to hell. I don't know if we have that same conviction. I don't know if we are truly convinced that people need the Lord. But we should ourselves as believers, if we call ourselves as believers, we should all be convinced that truly Jesus is the only Savior. And without knowing Him, these people are all going to hell. That's why we are so passionate about bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? You know what, let me just share this with you, not to boast of course, but of course as, as your speaker, I just want to be an example. Uh, when I came to know the Lord uh, in high school, um, as I have shared the gospel to several of my classmates. There's this one time when I, I brought my classmates to a church that is just across the street of our, of our high school. So I asked the pastor there, I asked the leaders there, to, can I bring my classmates? And then I shared the gospel with them. Of course, uh, uh, did anyone tell me? I cannot remember. Uh, uh, was I already doing G12 not during that time? No. But why did I do that? Why did I do that? Simply because I think it's natural for a true believer to have this desire to bring the people to the Lord. I was a very new believer then, no, but I was bringing people to the Lord Jesus. My daughter, she's now in, uh, in college, for sure college. You know what? She's sharing the gospel to public transport. Okay, uh, sometimes we call that in the Philippines, I hope you don't have it here, we call it jeepney. No? Uh, so my, uh, my, my, my daughter uh, will share the gospel to her fellow passengers. And one time she was, sharing, she, she was uh, talk, telling me that there's this guy who was seated with, with her and he, she shared the gospel. And because she noticed that all the other passengers were also listening while she was doing personal evangelism, she said uh, that I, 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 I spoke louder so that even the other passengers can hear. No? Okay? Uh, aside from the fact that there, there's time also when she shared to all uh, the, the passengers there. No? Uh, there's this time also, uh, in my case, as, as a testimony, uh, well, we have this. You know, one of the best islands they call, uh, they, they say, is the Palawan Island in the Philippines. No? Uh, if you are going there, uh, please bring me there. <laughs> okay, no, 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 I will be there. Uh, and there's this one time we, we have a big conference in the, in the city, uh, but the host treated us and brought us to the El Dido Islands. Wow, uh, God. Be a very beautiful place with uh, with lagoons, beautiful islands, and of course the main feature of the trip is the uh, island hopping. So we were in boats. Uh, we were in a boat, you know, with several couples. So it, the Lord uh, impressed in my heart to share the gospel with our fellow tourists there. So uh, I stood uh, in front of the boat and I said, "I'm going to share something with you. If you do not go, if you do not want to listen, you can just." Get, get down. No, no one got down. So, 
So I thought, wow, these people love to listen to me. No, 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 no not really. But, but in those instances, yeah, uh, why? Because we, is that natural for you, Pastor? No, I think my, my, my daughter is more introvert, uh, more extrovert, and I am more introvert. But, so is that very natural to me? But uh, why do you do that? Um, is, is, it, um, is it easy for you? No. But for the sake of the gospel, there are times when we really have, uh, when we really have to uh, also call that yeah, inner strength from ourselves, right? So that we can share the gospel. Amen. Amen. I share the gospel to a taxi driver while uh, while he's driving, but of course I did not ask him to close his eyes and pray to receive Christ. <laughs> no? uh, <laughs> but in, yeah, in many instances, uh, my wife and I were going to, for example, we were going to to Bogota. I shared the gospel to our fellow passenger from uh, to to LA, no, from the Philippines to LA. And then from from Bogota, Colombia to LA again, you know, we shared another a, a gospel, the, the gospel to another passenger yeah, from Honduras. And then uh, uh, from LA again to Manila, my wife shared the gospel to uh, an old woman uh, whom we uh, just met at the airport. Now, why? Because that should be our heart. Hello. So you say, oh, it's not just about numbers. No, it's about passion in bringing people to the Lord Jesus. Will these people become my members in the church? The, the, the ones who were seated with us in the airplane? Uh, the ones who were with us in the boat? No. They cannot be members of our church. So it's not just about increasing the people in our churches. It's about our passion to make Jesus known. Yeah. And if we are truly passionate about making Jesus known, of course it's but natural that we will not just be bringing people to the Lord who might be added to other churches, but we will also be bringing people to the Lord who might be added to our own church. That's why the churches are growing. Hello. Okay, we should have that passion to campaign for the Lord Jesus. Number two, number two is uh, uh, in verse 24. Of course, the report of what's happening in Antioch reached Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they have decided to, okay, let's send someone so that these believers uh, can have, uh, uh, of, of course, can be helped or receive more impartation. So, they have uh, sent Barnabas to Ancho. Now, and then, as in verse 24, you can see there that again the, the words great many people, right? Okay. Hello, great many people, no? So, uh, because of the efforts of the believers in sharing the gospel, great numbers were added to the Lord. But when Barnabas came, wow, great many people were again added to the Lord. Amen? And why? What's the key? What's the other factor? Number one, campaign. Number two, character. Character. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Hello? That's character. Okay? So, again, we are not just, just talking about numbers. We are talking about quality. Okay? So, because of this character, more people were added to the Lord. You know, do you, do you agree with me that character is so important? Yeah. yeah, credentials can bring you to the top, but only character can keep you there. Yeah. Without character, eventually, yeah, you will leave that place. You will be kicked out of that place. Right? Right? Okay. Charisma can attract people to you, but without character, you cannot keep them. Only character can keep them to you. Hello? So character is so important. But I'm not just talking now about character of the leaders. Of course, we are talking about the character of the people. Because we believe that our life should be an advertisement to the people around us. When the people see the change that is happening to our people, to the, to the ones who are going to church, of course, that serves as a, as, as a very positive advertisement. Right? That's why people are being attracted to the Lord. That's why we, we tell our people that, uh, let us show uh, the, the kind of life that we have, the, the life that has been changed by the Lord. Okay? Uh, because sometimes the problem with so many believers is that uh, they consider it that uh, change when, okay, Pastor, I used to be a drunkard, now I no longer, I no longer drink, I just eat. Huh? Okay. <laughs> okay? So that's good that you are no longer a drunkard. That's part of change, right? Right? Uh, you know what? I'm, I used to be a chain smoker, no? but now I just vape. No? <laughs> okay? uh, yeah, it's good that you are no longer 
smoking. I, I used to be an addict, you know? I used to be a womanizer. Okay? Yeah, it's good that you are no longer that kind of person. But please, transformation does not stop with vices. Because sometimes we consider our, our, our lives or ourselves um, mature believers, transformed believers simply because we do not have vices. Simply because we are not doing something that is wrong. And there are many Christians who are not doing wrong. And they are not also doing good. Yeah. Hello? I'm not doing anything evil, Pastor. Okay, good. Are you doing anything good? Not also. <laughs> so, what kind of Christianity is that? Christianity is not just about these vices, about the, not, the, not just about the evil things that we are we see on doing. Christianity is about the character. About the character of Christ that is being seen in us. Amen? And you know what? The problem with uh, so many Christians, that's why they stop growing. Uh, that's why they stop uh, changing in their characters is that they mirror themselves. They compare themselves. Not with the word of God, but with the other people, with the unbelievers. Of course, if we compare ourselves with the unbelievers, come on. No? We will look like angels. Like if we compare ourselves with the sinners. But no, they are not the standard. The standard is the word of God. Yeah. That's why we are not evangelizing. In G12, we are doing serious discipleship. Okay, because we want people to be transformed so that the people will use the Word of God as a mirror and then it will be the standard of their lives and not the sinners around them. Right? I, there's this story, I don't know if you heard of it, of, a, of, of two brothers who were faithful attenders of a certain church, but everybody in the community and even in their church, uh, they were co-church uh, members knew that they were hypocrites. They were leading evil lives. Okay, the church was, was not growing for a long time. Then eventually, a pastor came who was so serious about righteousness. He preached about sin. No? He preached about changed lives. Of course, the, these uh, two brothers uh, were being hit by the messages. But they just stick at the church because hey, uh, it, 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 it's one of their facade not to be religious. So they just stay there. But because of the passion of this pastor and because of his love for righteousness, the church was growing. And eventually, the whole church decided to build a new building because uh, their present venue cannot accommodate the growth anymore. So they have decided to to put up to, to build a new one. And while the building is under construction. You know what? The younger brother of these two, you know, they are so, so rich, but hypocrites. You know? uh, the, the younger brother died. So the older brother thought to himself, I want to honor my younger brother. And the way to honor him is, I think, through the pastor. Because the people here believe the pastor. So he went to the pastor's office and said, uh, and talked to the pastor and said, Pastor, uh, I know we have a church building project. Uh, how much do we still need? And the pastor said, uh, uh, so and so billion of dollars. Okay, pastor, I, I, I'll make you a deal. I'm going to give you right now the money that the building needs. I just want to ask of you one thing. <coughs> that please, uh, during the last week, the, the final night of my brother, can you just tell the people that he is a saint? The pastor thought a while, <coughs> Then, okay, okay, so give me the money. And he, uh, he received the check and in, in cash it and give it to the contractor and bought all the materials needed. So he spent all the money. And uh, the night of the, the week, the funeral service came and the pastor stood here uh, with the coffin there and with the brother there, the older brother, uh, and with the people of not just the congregation but the community and the pastor started speaking and said uh, brothers and sisters families friends you know the one who's lying in front of us now is a very evil person he's a hypocrite in the church and faithful to his wife three children to his business partners uh, worthless as a father but you know what compared to his brother he is a saint <laughs> So 
what's the problem, right? <laughs> so we look like saints when we compare ourselves to the sinners. But can you tell your neighbor, come on, can you tell the one seated beside you, the, the word of the Lord is the standard. That's why we are doing serious discipleship. Amen. Amen. Character. Now, you know what? Uh, um, uh, the, the, one of the verses that I love in the Bible is that because you love righteousness, the Lord has exalted you above your brothers. Okay? Now, when, when we are serious about righteousness, about holiness in our churches, then we will also see the, the mighty work of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I believe the Lord will bring more people to us. Because the Lord knows that if I bring this uh, this individual to this church, I know he will be taken care of and I know he will be discipled. Amen? Amen. That's because God wants Christ like this. Amen? Amen. He, remember the character that's, that's uh, mentioned there is what? Good man. No? He is a good man. That's one. Right? And, and we all know that only God is good. Right? So when you say, this man is a good man, well, that means God like. Right? You know what they say that the word godliness came from the word god likeness. Okay? So, so that's why we use the word Christ likeness because that's discipleship, that's the aim of discipleship to raise up people who are truly leading Christ like lives. Yes. Amen? Amen. Okay? So uh, Christ likeness. And what? Uh, uh, um, it was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, that's it. A great character that should be desired by all churches. That we should all be filled by the Holy Spirit, not just ministerially, but in our lives. They can see the joy, the peace of the Lord, the love. Hello. Okay. Gentleness, self control. Hello. Okay. So, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And of faith. You know, I see churches being revived, I see churches growing. Why? Because of the faith of the leaders. Because of the faith of the people. So if, if only we will be serious about faith and growing in our faith, then we will see more uh, uh, um, wonderful things happening in our respective churches. Yeah. Amen po? Yeah. Po? Okay. <laughs> number three. Number three. Uh, campaign. Character. Company. Company. Verse 26. Verse 26. What happened? Okay, in verse 26, when Barnabas saw that the church was really growing, so many people in Antioch were coming to the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles, so he thought, I need someone to be my partner, I need, I need to work with someone. So he looked for Saul, who of course we know eventually became Paul, right? And he brought him to Antioch. And in Antioch, again, they taught great many people. And I believe that the, this is just the same people. Of course, uh, this is not the only, the same many people, but of course, there's, it's still there, but it increased even more. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Because of company. We need some people. We need to partner with other people of God so we can see uh, multiplication in our churches. Yeah. Amen? You know, you, 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 we can see the great result of this tandem. Paul and Barnabas working together and, and so many people were added to the Lord. Right? So think about this. Uh, think about this. Uh, for, just for us to see how important is partnership. Okay. Think about this. One times one. Wow. Nice. One times ten. Wow. Okay. One times one hundred. Mm -hmm. Let me make it more difficult. One times one million. Okay. Is anything happening? No. Why? Because there's only one multiplier. Hello. Hello. Okay? So if you say 10 times 1, 10 times 100 times 1, 1 million times 1, for as long as the multiplicand and the multiplier is 1, nothing is happening. Right? Right? Okay? But you know what? With partnership, no? we can accomplish a lot for the Lord. Amen. Amen? In our respective churches, pastors, leaders, 
of the churches and our respective churches. That's why we're talking about cell groups. You see, uh, we, we have experienced the power of cell groups. Okay? Uh, uh, young, male young people having small groups, uh, female young people having small groups, adult women, adult men have their own groups, and you see with these groups, um, they are not just being uh, strengthened in their faith, uh, they are not just praying for one another, but through these cell groups, they are bringing so many people to the Lord. So when the cell groups are functioning, you, you can see many people coming to the Lord Jesus. Okay? That's why we really encourage churches to practice having cell groups. And we're going to talk more about this if, uh, 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 until tomorrow. No? Uh, but suffice it to say now that we, uh, please take this very seriously. Churches grow big because of small groups. Okay? Many people are added to the Lord's life because of these few people who are meeting regularly to strengthen one another and to bring people to the Lord. Okay? So that's the kind of companionship, that's the kind of company that we should develop in our churches. But, of course, uh, not just for individual churches, but as a body of Christ, I believe that one of the secrets here is that we should work together. Hello? You know what? Why is... Uh, Revival happening in the Philippines. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a Filipino. I, 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 objectively, I see that there's something different that is happening in the Philippines. Why is that, Pastor? You know why? Um, the pastors are working together regardless of their dogma, dogma and practice, no? Regar regardless of the traditions regardless of the uh, doct minor doctrinal differences of course when it comes to major no like in of course salvation by faith alone we do not sacrifice that okay trinity of course no um, but you know you know um, but by this by the cooperation of these pastors by the unity of these pastors we see uh, our churches growing no? there are more traditional churches old churches 100 year old churches or more of course, we know the Methodist churches, right? Baptist churches, Wesleyan churches, working with Pentecostals, working with Charismatics, working with independent churches. And we have regular fellowships. Okay, Pastor Tim was there, and he saw how I, how I do mentoring with churches who are much older than I. No? And you know what? I appreciate the humility of the pastors. Okay? Listening to younger pastors, no? Uh, and other pastors, educated pastors from the seminaries, listening to pastors who uh, did, not, did not have seminar, do not have seminary degrees, no? And we can see the unity. We can see not just the unity, we can see the humility. Yeah. And I believe, I believe that's the secret there. No? Uh, that's why uh, great things are happening in the Philippines because the pastors are ge getting united okay, for one common purpose. And what, what purpose is that? the Great Commission. Okay? Uh, we are united not just for the sake of unity, we are united for the sake of the mission that the Lord has given the church. Okay? So if we can do that here, you know, uh, I believe great things will happen, not just in Sydney. And you know what, before we came here, we're really praying that the Lord will, uh, will use this to be, uh, to be a great start so that uh, the yes. churches will be influenced of course of course this can only happen by the spirit of the lord you know? yes. but of course let's do our part you know? so that we can help more churches and we, i believe that if it happened in the philippines it can happen anywhere yes. amen yes. okay uh, let me just end this part you know, uh, uh, with the last verse of acts 11 uh, uh, last verse that we have read you now acts 11 verse 26 acts 11 verse 26 Okay, it says there, and the last sentence, the disciples were, come on, the disciples were first called Christians in Ancho. You know what? Prior to this verse, prior to coming to Ancho, Christianity has no name. Okay, they were just called followers of the way, disciples, right? But in Ancho, they were called Christians. Okay, admittedly, the name Christian was a derogatory term before. Okay? It was used to insult the Christians. Okay? But uh, we also know eventually that it becomes so acceptable. 
Uh, actually, Peter said that if you suffer for being a Christian, please God that you bear that name. So eventually, the word Christian is taken. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is this. Uh, they had no name yet. Then uh, the believers in Antioch shared the gospel. They grew. And of course, uh, as, they, as they grow in numbers and in character, you know, as they grow spiritually, of course, the people around them, them can't help but take notice of them. Because remember that the word Christian did not come from the Christians themselves. The word Christian, that name, came from the unbelievers. Okay? So what I'm saying is this. Because of their growth, because of something that is different um, with these people, maybe I was just imagining, maybe the people in the community were observing them and said, what is this group? Uh, why are they different? Why are they so many? Maybe the people were, ah, uh, they're followers of Christ. Ah, Christians. Okay? And you know what? What? The thing that I want us to have in our hearts is this. Because of the significant things that was happening to the church during that time, they were able to make a name for the Lord. Amen? So at the end of the day, what's this for? These are all for the glory of the Lord. And I hope that pastors here, leaders here would have the desire, Lord, we really want to make a name for you in our community and in this city. Lord, if your name is being forgotten, if the people here are so familiar now with the name Jesus Christ, no, we will not allow that to be just a familiar name. We will, allow, we, we will make that name glorified even more through our respective ministries. Come on, can we just uh, rise up, please? Can we just come to the Lord? And can we just pray? At the end of the day, it's about passion. Hello? Passion for the glory of the Lord. Right? Passion. So let's, let's just close our eyes. Let's come to the Lord. And let's just pray. Um, if it's okay with you, can you just um, place your hand in your heart? Just, let's, just ask the Lord. Lord, give me that holy fire. Lord, give us that passion. Lord, I pray tonight by the Holy Spirit, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for holy fire. I pray for passion in our hearts to glorify you, Lord, in our respective ministries, to glorify you, Lord, not just in our individual lives, but to glorify you all the more, Lord, in our cities, in our respective communities. Give us passion for your name. Give us holy fire, holy fire that will last a lifetime, Lord. Lord, please, that we will never lack fire in our lives. That we will never run out of passion. But as your people, as leaders, as members, as pastors of this church, of, of churches here, Lord, help us to always be on fire. Help us to always be on fire. To seek your glory. To love people. Help us, Lord, to love you even more. And I pray, Lord, for anointing, for multiplication. Give it tonight. Give it to churches. Give it to your people. Give it to your pastors, Lord. I pray for anointing for multiplication. Let us receive it, Lord. Receive it, Lord. Bless us with anointing to bring more people to you, to disciple people, to transform lives for your glory. Lord, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your favor. For this spiritual blessing, anointing, Lord. Anoint us now. Anoint us now. We receive it, Lord. Brothers and sisters, if you are asking this from your heart, receive. I want you to receive that. Receive in faith. Receive in faith. Come on, receive the anointing for multiplication in Jesus' name. You can multiply. God can use you. People will be saved through you. People will be transformed through you. Your churches can grow. In Jesus' name, receive the anointing for multiplication. We receive it, Lord. We receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. You can all be seated. Okay. Okay. How are you? It's been a long time. I miss you guys. 
Okay, is it okay if I immediately proceed to the second part? Yeah. Is it okay? But this will, I promise this will be shorter. Uh, about, maybe shorter by one minute. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I, there's this question that they want us to answer. No, what is G12? What is G12? Okay? So uh, we, 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 we have been hearing about this. And I don't know what you heard about G12 already. No, you may have heard something good. You may have heard something negative. No, uh, of course, uh, like other ministries, G12 also has its critics, and I don't want to deny that. No, uh, but of course, you are hearing from someone who are who is uh, truly doing G12 and who truly knows G12 and who truly knows the founder of uh, G12. No. So uh, I, I want you to have a clear perspective on what this ministry is, okay? Hello, okay? So what is G12? Well, uh, others when they think of G12, it's just about numbers. Again, I clarified that already. It's not about numbers. Others when they think of G12, it's about encounters. Now, have you heard of encounters? Yeah, encounters is good, and uh, uh, of course, uh, in the Philippines, even bishops, even pastors of uh, big churches were going through encounters. Uh, so don't think that I'm, uh, I'm past that, Pastor. Uh, I'm too holy for an encounter. Okay. Uh, okay. So regardless, ha. Huh? Okay. Uh, of course, um, this is a great, great part of the uh, strategy of G12. But it's not just about uh, the encounter. No, it's not just about um, about cell group. Yeah, it's part of it. No, but what is G12 really? And we're going to talk more about this tomorrow. Oh, and hopefully until Sunday. No, uh, but okay, what is G12? Number one, G12 is discipleship. G12 is discipleship. Okay, so this is uh, about Matthew 28:19 to 20. We're familiar with Matthew 28:19 to 20. Amen. For all have seen and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> okay, uh, and Jesus came. And said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay? And Lord, I am going to be with you to the end of the age. Okay? So that's the great commission. So what is G12, Pastor? G12 is Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Okay? Uh, it's about uh, discipleship. Now, now, uh, the, uh, the one thing that should be clarified here is, is this command of making disciple truly for all believers? Or is it just for the disciples of Jesus? Or maybe for the pastors, right? Or the missionaries, maybe. The, called, the, the, the people who are called to serve God full time, right? Okay, the leaders of the church. You know what? I want us to analyze this, not the verse. Uh, the Lord said, eh, um, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize, right? Hello? Yeah. And then what? Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. What? So every disciple of the Lord Jesus should be taught to obey everything the Lord commanded. Clear? Yeah. Clear? Now my question is, is the going and making disciple part of the command? Yeah. Hello? Or did Jesus say, uh, go and make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, except the one that I just said. Did Jesus say that? No. No, no. Right? Because some people think, okay, that those commands are uh, love one another. Hello. Of course, that's part of it. But why? Why did we? Uh, why would we accept this one? You no, know, the the last command, and as they say, the last command uh, of the dying person, the last words is very uh, the important words, most important words, right? Right? Okay, so uh, the Lord was living and he gave this very important command. So the command to make disciples is not just for leaders. It's for every true disciple of the Lord. If you count yourself a disciple of Jesus, you are also called to make disciples. Clear? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, so uh, and so what is, what is discipleship? Okay, actually in this verse, um, Matthew 20, yung verse 19, can you take a look? Can we take a look at verse 19? In verse 19, it says, go and make disciples. You know what? If we are going to analyze this verse in the Greek language, there's only one command 
Actually, the only one imperative here. Okay? What, there's only one command in this verse. What's that command? Okay? Make disciples. In English, uh, you have to translate it that way or else it will be broken or it will not sound very good. That's why it's translated that way. But you know, in Greek, there's only one command there. The command is make disciples. You know, in the Greek language, uh, when it's imperative, in an imperative mood, they use the word ate. Okay? Matetes is the word for disciple, right? You know, if you read it in Greek, it's written matete osate. Meaning, make disciples. That, that's command. Now, in Greek also, if we use the word participle, if we are going to make it participle, meaning a participial word is a support of another word. Okay? A participle in Greek is in a, always ended with ontes. You know what? For the word go, poyo, poyo is the word go. And in the Greek Bible, it's poyo ontes. Okay? Baptize is baptizo, right? In the Greek Bible, it's baptizontes. Okay? Uh, and uh, teach is didaske. Okay? Didake, of course, we know that, no? Uh, didaskontes. So, poyo ontes, baptizontes, didaskontes. Oh, these are all participial words. If they are participles, they are supporting a single word. The command. The command is go and make disciples. That's why you can put it this way. The command of the Lord is make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching. Hello? But there's only one command. So, the command is for us to make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching. Hello? Okay? That's why in G12 we use, we use this. No, we call it ladder of success. Win, consolidate, disciple, send. Now, win is going Okay? Consolidate is yeah, baptized because when the Lord Jesus baptized them, meaning incorporate them. Let them be part of my body already. Okay? So consolidate. And didaske, uh, disciple, no? Teach, no? Win, consolidate, disciple, and send. So that they can send, so that they can also win, consolidate, and disciple. Okay? I'm just giving you a uh, view in a quick way of G12. Is it clear? Pastors, uh, brothers and sisters, is it clear? Okay. So G12 is about discipleship. Okay. Number two. Number two. G12 is about oh, G, what is G12? G12 is discipleship. Number two. G12 is discipleship in cell groups. G12 is discipleship in cell groups. Okay. So we can do discipleship in so many ways, right? Hello, we can do it one on one. But one of the ways, and obviously one of the most effective ways to disciple someone is through small groups, through cell groups. And you know what? Um, if you are going to just observe what's happening in, in the world now, we can see that truly the Lord is using small groups, cell groups. Okay? You know, they say that actually. If, if, we, if, if the believers in China can only gather freely, like the ones that we are doing in the Philippines, or the ones that we are doing, that they do in Korea, if they can only have congregations, uh, big, uh, big gatherings, or in Bogota, you know what? If that is only allowed in China, because in China you are only allowed to gather 15 people, more than that it's illegal. Okay? But if, if believers there will just be allowed, they say that the biggest church must be in China. And you know what's the secret? They do not have big gatherings. They have small, regular gatherings. They call it house churches. Hello? That's the power of small groups. Okay? And is that biblical, Pastor? Acts 2, if you're going to take a look at Acts 2, uh, of course, the believers were baptized, right? Okay? And they devoted themselves, verse 42, no? uh, to the apostles' teaching, blah, blah. And then, what happened? No? And they gathered in the temple together and in their houses. Okay? And day by day, attending the temple and breaking bread in their homes. 
So two things, right? Hello, what kinds of gatherings uh, did the early believers have? Temple, houses. Hello, take note. They were breaking bread in their homes. Was breaking bread. Of course, they were doing communion. So even the small gatherings are, of course, right now, uh, now in many churches we consider that to be uh, something that that's done being that just being done in the church in, inside the church during Sunday service, right? Yeah. But that sacred communion is being done in small groups, meaning. Meaning, small groups is not less uh, sacred to big gatherings. Yeah. Hello? Hello, so why did the church uh, grow so, so fast in the early days? You know what, they have two secrets. Big gathering and small gathering. Okay, as they say that uh, the church before can be comparable to a bird. No? So the bird before was uh, like in my the church before was like a mighty bird with two wings. Okay, the first wing being large gathering, the second wing being small gathering. And during that time, in the time of Acts, the church is growing a lot. Okay, so it reaches greater heights, great heights, a mighty bird. But then Satan came to that mighty bird okay, in the form of a snake. And the snake uh, talked to the bird and said, you know, bird, I really admire you. You can fly so high, your wings are so strong. And you know, because of your so, so much strength, I believe that you can fly with just one wing. And the bird thought about it, the church, the, the church, not the bird, no? Thought about it, uh, I, I, I think that's not possible. Well, no, no, just try it, no? So the bird uh, began flapping the, 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 the wing, the, the right wing, no? then uh, it's difficult. No, no just try harder. No? And then, uh, then the, the bird was able to fly, and then, of course, the, uh, uh, the serpent said, See, that's how good you are, so keep it that way. No? And since then on, the church became, uh, became like that bird who was flying with just a single wing and forgot his her other wing hello and after uh we, we all know this right particularly in 350 a.d when the church become legal and emperor constantine declared it to be the official religion of the roman empire of course cathedrals cathedrals big churches you no know, big gatherings become so legal and you know what the church forgot the other wing and until today, the church forgets the other wing. So many churches are just concerned about this wing, the Sunday wing. Hello? So our, all, all our focuses are on Sunday gatherings. Right? We pray for our Sunday preaching. Uh, uh, we invite for our Sunday service. The worship team practice, practices for the Sunday service. Right? So all our attention, our focus on the large gathering on Sunday. So, so many churches are just using this wing. Huh? That's why, uh, you know what? Uh, when you fly with one wing, have you tried? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, maybe <laughs> if, you, if you just paddle a boat, okay, paddle a boat, just one side, what happened? It just goes around and around. That's what happened to this mighty bird. No, because, yeah, she was able to fly with just one wing. But you know what? Yeah, she reads nothing. No, she just goes round and round. Many churches now are going round and round. No, over and over again. Okay, year by year, the same story. Why? Because we are so focused on just one wing. But I believe that can change. Amen. Hello? Okay? So yeah, let's take the, this very seriously, cell groups. It's very important. Uh, consider cell groups as one of the, mo one of the most important. Actually, uh, it, yeah, we have Sunday service and then cell groups. Okay? Uh, cell group is so 
important. If I do not, if I cannot cancel Sunday service, I will not cancel some groups. Hello. If I pray for my Sunday service, I will also pray for my cell group. If I prepare, if I spend energy and time for my Sunday service, I will also spend energy and time for my cell group. That's the pattern of the church of the early believers. We might as well follow the pattern. Hello. Okay. Okay. Uh, number three. Number three. What is G12? G12 is Discipleship, G12 is discipleship in cell groups. Number three, G12 is discipleship in cell groups through teams of 12. Okay, through teams of 12. That's why we are using the word 12. Okay, the number 12. Okay, so why 12, Pastor? Well, G12, listen carefully, listen. No? G12 is our way of obeying Christ's command. What is the command? Go and make disciples. That's for everyone. Okay? But why 12, Pastor? Yeah, because G12 is not just our way of obeying Christ's command. It is also our way of following Christ's example. Hello? Since the Lord discipled 12, okay, why will I not uh, just imitate the example of the Lord. Okay, did he command? Did he command uh, that is all, that we should disciple? Well, not really. Not, not, not really. But uh, in, in my case, I just want to follow the Lord. Is there anything wrong, wrong with that? Hello? Others are saying, wow, why disciple 12 people? Did Matthew, did Peter, did John, James have 12 disciples? I don't know about that, but what I know is that Jesus had 12. And I'm not, I, I'm not really following Peter, I'm really following Jesus. <laughs> Hello? So is there, is there anything wrong if I follow Jesus? Besides, as a, uh, as a believer, you know, it's really good when we imitate something very practical. No? Right? Yeah. In, in the life of the Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. Because others are imitating Jesus in what? They fast for 40 days. Okay, that's okay. When, when someone pass for 40 days, we respect the person. Wow. Wow. No? So heavenly. Okay? But when someone disciples 12, why, why, the, why do other people lift their brows, their eyebrows? Right? What's wrong with that? You know, actually, as believers of the Lord, I think uh, we, can, uh, we can consider this. No? As believers of the Lord, I want to follow something practical. I want to imitate something practical about Jesus. And I want to give you some choices. Number one is, you can fast for 40 days. Okay? Uh, or stay single. Just Jesus. Just like Jesus. <laughs> Others think, that's too late, Pastor. <laughs> Had I heard that earlier. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so, yeah, you can pass for for the day. You can uh, stay single, uh, or if you want, you can feed 5,000. Is it okay? Feed 5,000 no? with two fish. <laughs> okay, or you can walk on water. You can also try that. What, what do you want? Walk on water or swim on land? Which is easier? <laughs> okay, so you can walk, or, or actually, you can disciple too. I think that's the easiest. Hello, so G12 is copying the easiest. <laughs> Hello, but, but 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 seriously, seriously, no. Uh, there's nothing wrong when we imitate no? uh, the Lord, right? Uh, you know, when the Lord Jesus was about to be crucified. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember, in John 17. And in John 17, what was, what was the content of Jesus? He introduced it this way. He said, uh, Father, uh, I have accomplished. I have, uh, I have fulfilled the work that you have sent me to do. So what is this work that Jesus is talking about or was talking about? Was it his crucifixion? No, because he's still alive. Right? He was just about to be crucified. No? So what's about that? Yeah, of course, if you're going to study John 17, you will find that the focus of the prayer of the Lord Jesus was about his 12 disciples. 
and those who will believe through that will. So it is very likely that the Lord was referring to that will because that's what he did. Right? Before dying on the cross, he made sure that he had 12 disciples. Of course, uh, why, why is that? Because when he, if ever he died earlier than uh, after he formed his 12, there, there would be no one to continue what he has started. Okay? So, the Lord Jesus, before being crucified, because you know, do you believe that at any age, the blood of the Lord Jesus is enough? To redeem us. Hello? Had Jesus died at the age 30? Why 30, Pastor? Because really, uh, uh, the Lord uh, started ministering at age 30. And then he died at age 33. Right? He formed his will for three years. But could have he died uh, at age 30, which is the legal age, by the way, 30, because that's the legal age. Uh, in his time, uh, 30 down is youth. Okay, so youth here was still youth. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, so so that's the legal age. So, but why spend three years more? Why, if I if I if I were Jesus, I would rather go back to heaven. That's much better there, yeah. right? Yeah. But why would I spend three years more on earth? Because I because before I die, I should be able to disciple twelve. So that this 12 can continue his mission. Yeah. Right? So we have no right to die until we have 12 disciples. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? <laughs> of course, again, as I'm saying, it's, it's not, we're, let's not be legalistic about, about numbers. No? Of course, the Lord asked us to, uh, told us all to make disciples. But again, Jesus set the model. And I, I don't know about you, but as for me, I'll just follow the example of the Lord. I think it's better that way. It's easier that way. Right? Because maybe sometimes uh, time will come when we will face the Lord in His throne. Right? And I, I just think, what if the Lord asked me, Rabbi, what did you do on earth while you, was, well, while you were still alive? No. Uh, I could say, Lord, uh, I serve as an usher. Okay, being an usher is good. Right? But will that be my best answer? Okay? Uh, Lord, I sweep the floor because I read Jesus wept. So, I just followed you, Lord. Okay. For example, yeah, sweeping, cleaning is good, right? But you know what? I, I, I believe the best, the best uh, answer is, Lord, I made disciples. Why? Because that's the Lord's command. Because so many members in our churches today are spending much time and effort and so committed with the things that this, Jesus did not command. But with the things that Jesus commanded, you forget it. Come on. If you're going to spend time and energy, why not on what Jesus actually commanded? Yes. Okay, so the Lord will ask me, Rabbi, what did you do on earth? Lord, I, I disciple. And what if there's a follow-up question? And the Lord said, the Lord asked, How many disciples did you make? Uh, Lord, I discipled 15. What if the Lord asked again, Lord, I why 15? Uh, then I have to think of an answer, right? If the Lord says, uh, why, if I, if I say, Lord, I disciple three, and the Lord asks me again, why three? Uh, but if I say, Lord, I disciple twelve, and the Lord asks, why twelve? Lord, I copied you. <laughs> oh, you see, it's better, it's easier to pass the exam in heaven if you are just copying Jesus. But really, nothing wrong when we copy something uh, uh, from what the Lord did. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's the, that's the heart of G12. Okay, the Lord called me to make disciples. I'm going to do this in a cell group. So, and my goal is for my disciple in cell group to be 12 people. Okay? And please, don't think that, that's so hard, pastor, no? Because some other churches say, other, other pastors might be thinking, pastor, G12 will not work for us. Why? Because we're only 11. <laughs> Why? So just because you're 11? No? Or, or you're just 10 or 9? <laughs> no. Jesus did not have uh, 12 immediately. He, he won them one by one. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah. He called Peter. He called Peter, James, and John. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you can start with three. <laughs> you can start with one. 
Hello, and believe me, if you can do it with one, you can do it with twelve. Yeah. If you have a heart for a single person, you can also have a heart for twelve people. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's G12. No? In a nutshell, maybe. No? Discipleship in cell groups through teams, teams of twelve. Amen po? Amen. Okay, so okay, uh, tomorrow we're going to entertain questions but as we promise and we should be time conscious we'll be until nine only so yeah i think it's nine because it's seven o'clock in my watch so it's philippine time no? <laughs> okay so thank you thank you uh, i hope to see you again tomorrow uh, and please bring more of your leaders more of your people maybe we can still invite more pastors uh, because we truly believe that the lord is doing uh, something new and uh, we can be part of something big that the Lord is doing. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to give the time again to our. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.